My name is Maureen North. I uh, also do the same job for a living that Tom does, so I'm kind of watching this a different way. And of course, you're now the subject of investigation. <laughs> but um, that was such a wonderful, uplifting film. And um, one of the things that I was struck by that you said in the beginning of the article was that Fred Rogers demanded sort of an honest, uh, let, me, let me read it so I get it right with my glasses. That Fred Rogers insisted on an unashamed insistence on intimacy. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Yeah, um, I, I think that the, one of the things that I love that the movie captures um, was the insistence part of that. Uh, I mean, I think that everybody knows about the, um, the intimacy that Fred tried to live by and tried to project, but the movie really captures the thing that I've always tried to tell people about Fred, which was about his strength and is about really the force of his personality and character. He was uh, a soft-spoken man, but he was definitely not a soft man. Um, he was extremely strong. And the strength of his, of his faith, the strength of his love is, is, to me, in every frame of that movie. And it's one of the things that I love about it. You know, what's so interesting is that, of course, the backstory, because most of what was on the screen about you and your father is not in the article at all. If there is, was that a real story about you and your father and Fred Rogers? Um, what Micah and, and Noah got ex exactly right in the movie was that my friendship with Fred was driven by the complexities of my relationship with my dad. My dad was a really complex character different in some ways than, than Chris Cooper is, who does, I mean, Chris Cooper does an amazing job in that movie of projecting a certain kind of guy. Um, but my, my dad was, uh, was, was sort of like that, but sort of different. But anyway, the, 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 I had a very complex relationship with my dad. My, my father was a very complex person, but I, did de I definitely did not take a swing at him at, a, uh, at, a, at my sister's wedding or anything like that. And your picture did not appear with the, in, in Fred Rogers' program with a big scar on his nose or anything like that. No, that did not. No, because your article is so funny. I mean, you had so many amazing anecdotes about Fred Rogers watching him and people, the way people reacted to him on the street and everything. Yeah, in, in New York, I, I mean, the, the, this movie is, is highly, is highly G-rated. I mean, I think that's the, that the, the worst word than, than anybody um, uses in it is crap. Um, <laughs> but in, in, in really walking with Fred in New York City, um, I mean, he was, he wasn't just Mr. Rogers, he was Mr. Effin Rogers in New York, so. <laughs> Tell, just please just tell that one story about your city and those guys and watching them just getting Mr. Rogers, Mr. Effin Rogers and, uh, autographs. I, I was in Penn Station and, um, and people just, sort of like the, the, the way the people are in the, in the subway scene in the movie, they're, they're kind of like looking at him and they're like, is that, is that who I think it is? Is that Mr. Fuckin' Rogers? Yeah, that's Mr. Fuckin' Rogers, you know. <laughs> and, they just... and, 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 you know, and of course, you know, I mean, the thing about Fred is that, is that nothing that was human is alien to him. And so all, the, all that stuff was just, was just delightful to Fred. You know, and he, was, he, loved, he loved that kind of stuff. He loved, he loved all the things that make us human. And, and um, <clears throat> Micah and Noah, I wanted to ask you because um, how old were you when you did, how did you come to find Tom's story, first of all? And I guess you both grew up with Mr. Rogers. Yeah, I, I mean, we, I grew up with Mr. Rogers kind of like everyone did. Uh, he was just sort of there. And uh, I think as I got older, I sort of forgotten about it. And uh, as Micah and I were Look, we're always sort of looking for interesting people or stories to write as writers do. And um, when we started this project almost 10 years ago, I had a two-year-old. Uh, I had a very stubborn two-year-old who's now a very stubborn 12-year-old. <laughs> uh, and I was really, I, I think, to be fair, struggling with how to communicate with 
the toddler, and it was, I was a first-time parent, and and I put uh, Mr. Rogers on YouTube, and uh, he started talking in that slow voice, and my daughter turned to the computer and started listening in a way I had never seen her listen before. And I think he was saying, like, let's do some calisthenics. And she started going. <laughs> and I was like, who is this person? This warlock um, unlocking the, the secret to a toddler. And uh, I, so I called Micah. And I think that immediately we started looking into Fred. and. No, but uh, wait a second. You called Mike and said, hey, we should make a movie about No, Mr. I said Rogers. I've discovered I mean, a warlock <laughs> oh, okay. who can unlock. No, but, but I, I did say, hey, look, like Fred is, and I, I watched a ton of it. Michael watched a ton of it. We realized really quickly that there was something fascinating about this man. But we also quickly realized that he was uh, a pretty terrible subject for a conventional biopic. Right. You know? The kinds of things yeah, just that ooze honey for two hours over the screen, right? Yeah. Right, and right. and uh, it was only in you know, and and, and we had read uh, Tom's marvelous article uh, before, and we were we were uh, actually in Latrobe um, at the Fred Rogers uh, uh, archive, and um, we were just digging for something that could serve as the shape of this story. Um, and as Tom said, Fred was compulsively intimate. He'd meet somebody casually on an airplane, on the set, and all of a sudden he would involve himself in their lives. And, uh, and it, wouldn't, it would never end there. It would be letters, it'd be follow-up. Um, and when we were in the archive, we just discovered you know, uh, decades worth of correspondence between all kinds of people many of whom dealing with um, their own personal crisis. Uh, and then we saw the, the Tom Junod box. <laughs> they brought it out like this. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what started for us, certainly, as an article that we loved, um, uh, grew into something much bigger. The, uh, the relationship between Tom and Fred didn't end in 1998. It continued on for five years until Fred died. And it was seeing this, I guess for lack of a better term, personal ministry that was happening that for us at the time felt very voyeuristic and sitting up here still does. Uh -huh. uh, that became for us the ingredients of the feature. Because Mr. Rogers did want to become a minister at one time in his life. He was a minister. He was a minister, he excuse me. And I, I just want to inject just one personal note. I, I wasn't really good friends with him, but he had a, he had a house in, in, on Nantucket where he spent the summers called the Crooked House. And my family and I had a, a rented house down the road a little bit. And actually, which is one of the things that's so interesting is that Mr. Rogers came from a very affluent background in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and his mother had donated the whole huge uh, what's called Smith Point in Nantucket was donated by his mother. It belonged to their family uh, to conservation. And he lived in a funny little house called the Crooked House. And that's where they spent summers. And, and his fun cousin, who was, I don't want to say his character was not like him, but he acted a lot like your dad in the movie, um, was <laughs> lived in Mr. Rogers' mother's chauffeur's cottage, which was on the corner, and they always had a summer celebration of Thanksgiving for the summer, which was such a Mr. Rogers thing to do. And he he just made friends and and with all the kids. And um, when we were saying goodbye that night uh, from the Thanksgiving, my son, who was uh, Luke, was about. Eight, 10 years old at the time, he put his hand on the window like, like this, and Mr. Rogers was already outside, and he put his, window, his hand right back on the window like that. You know? So that's my Mr. Rogers story, and I'm sorry I had to do that. Yeah, well, that but that's a, that's a gesture that you could see in the movie. You could, exactly. Putting his, putting his hand and, to the window is something that's perfectly in keeping with that. And, and I also want to say something that was in your article that you used beautifully in the movie in a completely different way, and I think you guys should tell the story, is that one minute of silence. Yeah, Loving um, we, we thought it was, I mean, it was, it was in the earliest draft of the, of the screenplay. 
we had this, uh, uh, I don't know, notion, fantasy, uh, risk to, um, to try to give uh, a theater audience the experience of what Fred Rogers would do in person. I mean, so much of the movie is uh, hopefully uh, trying to help uh, an audience get to know, uh, to sort of commune spiritually with Fred Rogers, to, to, to frame the entire uh, movie as an episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood that's for grown-ups, that's about this guy. Uh, but that moment of silence, uh, we always thought, oh man, wouldn't it be crazy if we asked everyone in the audience to be quiet and really quiet for, for a minute to actually think about the people who loved them into being, uh, which is something, of course, that Fred did uh, with with Tom here. Tom, uh, he did it, but he did it with, I mean, mostly Fred did it with crowds. Yeah. Mostly Fred did it with, Fr Fred would Fred would appear, um, he, he did it at the Emmys. He did it That's at the so daytime. He did That's it the, the answer I'm looking for. He did it at the daytime <laughs> Emmys when, like, um, you know, newscasters and, you know, a lot of soap like, stars. A lot of soap opera stars were there, like Susan Lucci and all, you know, all these people. And he, um, when he, uh, accepted his daytime Emmy, he went up and asked this crowd um, to take a minute of silence and to think of the people who love them into being. And if you if you look at the tape of it, and I think that the tape of it might be available on YouTube, you know, you see people at first, they, they, they don't know what to do. Like so much of what Fred did, I mean, it, it throws you off balance. It throws you off guard. As, as Lloyd slash I am continually in this movie, I'm continually off guard. And, and that's what it was like. But then you see people all of a sudden, after their initial discomfort, they become quiet. And as they become quiet, you see them lock into that, into that, that feeling that he wants, and then all of a sudden you have this this crowd of, of TV people and TV stars in all their makeup, and, and, and yeah, weeping, and it's this it's this amazing um, it's this amazing sequence. And Fred did that um, all over the place. It was really the the, the thing that he asked crowds um, to do. And I, I, one of the things that I love about this movie are the risks that it takes in terms of pacing and in terms of the intimacy it builds with the audience. I mean, you see in that, in the movie, how long one minute of screen time is. I mean, it's, I was listening and, and just that, that, the silence of it was just, was just so remarkable in a, in a, in a movie theater. And uh, that's what these guys did. I just got to ask you one question. Yes. <laughs> Were you glad Matthew Reese played you? <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> I mean, he's amazing in this movie, and and because once again, it's it's there's so much in the movie that is different from my life. You know the, you know sort of kind of the violence of the emotions is is you know it's not something that I that I experienced, but when you see somebody who's named Lloyd Vogel, and kind of doing you. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's wild. I gotta tell you guys, it's, it's, it's really something. So, so, was it hard to get this movie made? Uh, yeah, it was really hard. Uh, very hard. I mean, yeah, it took, uh, like I said, Micah and I started this uh, like almost 10 years ago. And I think uh, at first we went out and pitched it. Like we went out and just said, hey, we want to do this movie about Fred um, Rogers. About Fred Rogers and a journalist and, and people. Um, we got everywhere passed. Everywhere. Um, it's too difficult. Uh, no one knows who Mr. Rogers is outside of the U.S. Um, we'll never get the rights, et cetera, et cetera. And so Mike and I kind of took it upon ourselves. We hired ourselves to write it. Yeah. <laughs> it was a rough negotiation. <laughs> brutal. Brutal. Um, and so we, we spec'd it uh, without, without the rights, meaning we wrote it um, you know, with no one involved, just kind of wrote it and hoped that someone would respond to it. And uh, someone did. So Big Beach uh, is the producer of this movie. Uh, Peter Seraf and Leah Holzer read it. And the estate read it. 
and the estate basically, well, I should say, Bill Eisler, who um, is played by Enrico in the movie, um, he's like, okay, I'll talk to you guys, basically. All right, fine, I'll talk to you guys. And, uh, and he, he said, uh, I'm happy to talk to you, but first thing you need to know is there will never, ever be a Fred Rogers movie. But go ahead, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was our first conversation with Bill. And then eventually we earned his trust and uh, he, he gave us access to Joanne, and then we earned her trust, and then they let us go to the archive, and we found, you know, the Tom Juno box, and, um, you know, they, they adore Tom, so I think when that, when that sort of came together... Um, he was your key. It, he was the key, yeah, it was the key. And from that point on, uh, I mean, when Mari, when Mariel Heller came on, it was really when the momentum of the movie changed. But from the time you wrote the script and had a finished script to the time you really um, were able to make it as a movie, how many years passed? Was that a long time? I mean, I think we, yeah, probably nine, nine years probably okay. from now. Yeah, so a long, long time. So and it was just Yeah, and you around. go through various you know, stages and people fall on and fall off. And when Mari came on, um, she sat down and said, so who, you know, who have you always wanted to play Mr. Rogers? And we sort of, you know, we're like, well, we always kind of wanted Tom Hanks, but <laughs> let's come back down to planet Earth. Yeah, right, right? And she goes, well, I'll call him. He was probably dying to do somebody like Mr. Rogers. I mean, he played Walt Disney. We tried to approach him years earlier, and he kind of was like, I'm not, not that into it. But when Mari Heller calls, he listens. Oh, yeah, I mean, she, she, um, she made that happen. And then, of course, when... When he says yes, you have a movie. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's when we should turn this over to the audience. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of the three of these outstanding men up here? Barbara? Sure. I'm just wondering, uh, Tom, was there a moment when you were interviewing Fred in which you actually got up and said, we're done, and left early? Um, OK, so the question was, did when I interviewed Fred, did I actually get up and said, we're done and walk out? And the answer is no. Um, I mean, I, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Movies. <laughs> Hollywood. Um, but no, the answer is uh, no. I mean, I, but it, the thing that the movie captures is that, I mean, I, I, I talked to Fred. I mean, I had three separate um, reporting trips um, to see him. And, um, you know, some of them were quite lengthy. I, you know, I traveled to Pittsburgh twice. I saw him in New York. Talk about swimming in one, four, three. And I, yeah, I saw him. I saw him swimming, and I saw him. Okay, so this is. A, I'm going to answer your your question, but then I, I do want to add the anecdote that that Maureen's asked me to. Um, so, uh, so he didn't answer a single question <laughs> that, that I asked him over 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 you know the course of of two months. I mean, he was exactly like he is in the movie. And every person we talked to said the same thing, was that he, he was emotional judo, yeah. right? So you'd ask him, what you, yeah, I, sorry, what you <laughs> and, and so that, so that, that is true, but I never, I mean, I knew, I knew from pretty much the beginning that A, I had never met a person like him, and that B, he might not answer questions, but you know, I, I had to be smart enough to say, I'm, I'm gonna go along for the ride. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't walk out on him. Um, but the, the the anecdote that that Maureen asked about is that you know I did I did um, I went I went swimming with with Fred Rogers and uh, and I saw Fred Rogers uh, stark naked uh, in a, in a locker room and I can tell you that he didn't have any tattoos on him from his uh, his Navy SEAL days. Um, but the thing that was really really extraordinary um, and that is uh, it's. It's in the story that I wrote, but not in the movie. Is that so? When he got on his scale, there was a scale at the at, he was at the the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, and he got on the scale, and he he it, the scale went boom to uh, 143, and he was like, good. And I walked out. He goes, I said, well, what's that? And he goes, well, you know, well, Tom, uh, every day of my life, I I I, I weigh myself and. Every day of my life, I weigh 143 pounds, and and so his his um, his email address uh, on AOL 
was ZZZ143. <laughs> and, the, and the ZZZ was to signify that he sleeps soundly through the night, that he was at peace. And the 143 was to say that every day that he weighed 143 pounds, but that the 143 uh, was the, the amount of letters that it takes to say, I, one, love, four, you, three. So 143 meant I love you. So every day he stood on a scale and that came. And I mean, I think about that and it's, it's just Those wild. are the moments why you become the kind of journalist that we are. <laughs> Any more questions? researching a 400-word profile, so was that part true? <laughs> Anybody who knows uh, me as a writer knows that I, I, I've never written 400 words, even <laughs> signing my name. And there's never been a female so, yeah, editor yeah. of Esquire, either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly true. Not by a long shot. You know, we... Uh, <laughs> I guess, I guess we're really picking this thing apart. Um, <laughs> uh, a, uh, an editor friend of mine um, actually referred to it as a horror movie uh, for a magazine editor to send out someone on a 400 word assignment and get 10,000 words back. Would have Not been if the words are like that. Yeah. And I, I worked for Esquire for uh, 20 years um, under, a, uh, under an editor, a great, great editor named David Granger. And I can say that David Granger never once in those 20 years said, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> he said the highest compliment David Granger could ever give was, pretty good. <laughs> that was it. Good, good, wasn't, good wasn't great, but pretty good. Was there was a question uh, back here in the middle. Yes. Thank you. So the, uh, the question was about the documentary, whether it, uh, we felt that in making this movie we had uh, missed our window. Um, and um, we, we loved that documentary. And if you haven't seen it, you should. It's really marvelous. Um, we actually had met uh, Morgan Neville, the, the director, on the, set, on the set of a different thing um, a few years ago. And he was saying, hey, you guys are working on a, on a Mr. Rogers project, right? And we said, uh, yeah, I mean, only for the last five years, but, uh, and he said, you know, uh, we're, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, of doing a, a doc about him. And we said, great. And then we, Noah and I kind of smugly looked at each other and said, well, like, ours will be out way before his. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that was not, not, that was not the case, but uh, we really hope that these, that these two features are, are kind of siblings, uh, and that you know, if you can make ten Marvel movies a year, maybe there can be enough room for two Fred Rogers movies in well, two years. There's actually. Because of Nantucket, there's actually a third Fred Rogers documentary that was made about 12 years ago, I guess, or 10, 10 or 12 years ago. And actually, the thing that's so interesting about that is that it was, it was a similar situation where the person, Ben Wagner, who worked for MTV in the early days, who made the movie, his parents were going through a divorce, and, and Fred Rogers lived right across the road in, in Nantucket and recognized his, his, his pain, I guess, and that's how they became friends, and that's when the movie, I mean, the movie got made after he grew up, but um, there's actually a third Mr. Rogers movie. If, if we have one more, we can start a, uh, like a Mr. Rogers con. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, who'd go, after this, who'd go to a Mr. Rogers film festival? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for such a wonderful, uplifting film.